It was quiet in the office. We were about our jobs. Suddenly, I looked up. The door was open, and a small man came in, pointing a revolver at me. He said to me, sit down. Don't even flinch. I, I went numb. Then he left and closed the door as he went. Clement sat here, Pep sat there. Clement was the first to speak. Meep, he said, it's over. We sat without knowing what to do. Suddenly, Bep got up and she began to wail and shake through her whole body. I stayed seated. I don't know why. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't comfort her. And Kleiman went to her. He said, here's my wallet. Go to the druggist on the Lely Grock. Don't give it to him. Simply display it to show that you know me. He's a friend of mine. Ring my wife and tell her what's happened here. And then, then beat it and don't ever come back. Ellie looked at me helplessly, wondering what to do. I said, Get going, Ellie. She took off running, and she didn't come back. That alerted us that there was no sentry at the door. A bit later, I heard Jan's footsteps. It was lunchtime. Before he could come in, I ran to the door with my sandwich, my ration book, my money, and my papers. I opened the door and said, Jan, it's gone wrong here. Clear off. Off he went. There was simply no point in involving anyone else. The fewer people involved, the better. So off he went. We sat there, Kleiman and I. He looked at me. And because it was still possible to leave, he said, me, there's still time. You can go. I said, no, I can't. I'm going with you. So we sat there. A little while later, the door to the inner office opened, and it stayed open. Then someone came and called Kleiman in. Behind the door, a man was speaking in German. It had a very familiar sound. He spoke with an accent. That much was clear. When Kleiman returned, the gravity of the situation became clear. At least how dire it was. He said, Meep, See that you stay out of it. Salvage what you can here. He was taken away. I thought, yeah, that's easier said than done. Meanwhile, the small man with the revolver had returned. He sat down opposite me at Pep's desk and rang for an extra van. They hadn't expected to find so many people. He left the door open. In the hall, I heard the German issuing orders. Finally, I recognized the accent. He spoke with a Viennese accent. I was born in Vienna. I came here at the age of 11. I've completely assimilated. When I heard that, I thought, I've got one chance. I'm going to take it. And I did take it.
He marched in. Before he could utter a word, I stood erect. Germans are accustomed to that. I said, you're from Vienna? Me too. I said it rather cheerfully. The man was shocked so utterly that he just stood there, staring. He could never have imagined that he would meet a fellow Austrian here. He closed the door and round it on me. He was hunched. He was going to let me have it. He said, papers. I gave them to him, identity papers. He looked at them, thrashed them against my face and started to swear. Have you no shame helping Jewish scum? You're a traitor to your country. Your crime demands the highest penalty. I think you know what that is. I didn't answer. What's the point of speaking to someone like that? I stood at attention. He seethed with anger. He paced the length of the room, swearing at me, but I didn't respond. At a certain moment, he paused. He sized me up with a more mild gaze and said, as far as I'm concerned, you can stay. But if you ever leave, we'll seize your husband. I made a blunder then. But it came out all right. I was so angry that I said, you keep your hands off my husband. He's got nothing to do with this. It's my affair. He said, don't be so foolhardy. He's up to his neck in this. He said, I'm leaving now, but I'll be back to check if you're still here. I thought, you can be bloody sure I will. I'm staying come what may. The thing was, I understood what Kleiman had meant. Me see that you stay out of it. Salvage what you can here. If one Christian remained in a house where the Jews had been, only the property of the Jews was removed. Christian property remained intact. So the business remained intact. The stocks and the equipment remained. Otherwise, four days later, everything would have been appropriated as the house was closed. The thought was, if she stays, the business can be saved. It was August of 1944. Anyone of any intelligence could see that the Germans were losing the war. I don't know what went on in the annex, since I was obliged to stay at my desk. He closed the door and departed. Later, I heard them all trudging down the stairs. In the interim, they were allowed to pack, and then they descended the stairs. I couldn't go to the window. I was compelled to stay here. I did so. We went upstairs then, to the Frank's bedroom. Beppe and I saw lying on the ground the pages of Anne's diary. We saw scattered pages. That's Anne's diary. Gather it up, I said. Beb just stood there gawking. I said, pick it up. Pick it up. Take it. We preserved it as carefully as possible. We were stunned. We gathered it together and went downstairs. I said, what now, Beb? She said, you're the oldest. You should keep it. I said, okay. I took it and put it in my desk. I locked up or at least closed the door. And that's where it remained until Mr. Frank returned.